Hello, everyone. I am Ben Johnson, and this is the Perpetual Chess Podcast. Perpetual Chess is a weekly chess interview show where we talk with accomplished chess players, authors, and personalities about their lives, their careers, and how to improve at chess. Perpetual Chess is brought to you through the generosity of its Patreon and PayPal supporters and by Chessable.com. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Perpetual Chess, Chess Books Recaptured. Uh, A lot of listeners are probably familiar with this uh, break from an interview. It's more of a conversation. We do a monthly book recap of a classic chess book, um, give you some culture, um, give you a book that maybe you're thinking about reading or just reliving, and, uh, of course, maybe um, share a few improvement takeaways from a book that we read. And this month, we will be discussing a classic book, Irving Chernov's popular chess book, Logical Chess, Move by Move. And we will be joined by a uh, listener of the podcast and college instructor and father of four uh, joining us from my old hometown of Brooklyn, New York, Barry Katz. How's it going, Barry? Uh, it's great. It's a real honor to be here. I'm thrilled. i uh, been looking forward to this for a long time. So uh, yeah, thanks for having me on. Yeah, my pleasure. And I was I was glad when you reached out to uh, discuss this book. This book, listeners, this one is for newer chess players. I know we have a lot of newer chess enthusiasts out there. Shout out to all you guys. And also, of course, for appreciators of the classics, because this book was written in 1957, or at least first published in 1957. And uh, I know different people have different proclivities in terms of like, reading old chess books or reading old books, you know, classic novels and watching old movies. I'm someone who has a little bit of a modern lean. My wife always wants to watch black and white films and I'm not that into them, to be honest. And a book like My System, of course, comes up all the time. And as I've hinted at many times, it's not my favorite. I find it to be like the writing style I find to be a bit dense. And um, I, I feel like you can get better chess instruction in newer books. But I don't really feel that way about this book. This book I consider to be truly timeless, which we will discuss more. But first, Barry, since you're the one that chose this book, why don't you tell us a little bit about what it is that drew you to Logical Chess Move by Move? So I was late to the party in terms of uh, discovering chess. I played a little bit as a kid, but nothing serious. And then uh, when my son, who was 11 uh, last year, started playing with his classmates, uh, before school, you know, they would come to school early and play. Uh, so he started watching videos and I happened to notice once he was watching a video from the St. Louis chess club. And, uh, I just became fascinated by it. And I said, wow, chess is so much more than I thought it was, uh, in terms of, uh, all the depth to it. This is not checkers. This is not a fellow, uh, candy land. I mean, this is a game that has a tremendous, amount of knowledge and, and theory and all that. And uh, I became hooked and I started to uh, watch videos. And I, I was trying to improve. And uh, one of the resources, I know uh, he's a friend of the podcast, uh, the chess book collectors uh, group on Facebook uh, where people discuss books and people would go ask, um, you know, which is a good book for improvement. Now uh, the problem as uh, Max Illingworth, I know you had him on a few weeks ago, uh, said is that when you ask such a question, it's like going to a doctor and asking, well, uh, what can I do uh, to make myself healthier? What medication can you uh, prescribe me? Well, the doctor's got to assess you because not every medicine is good for every person. Uh, and I found that to be the case because I went to the library, took out a bunch of books, and the, the books that were way above my head, I, I would get lost in the first couple of pages. And I said, I, I don't know what's flying here because uh, I didn't know a whole lot of theory and it was just uh, very difficult for me to understand what was going on. And uh, in this chess book collectors uh, group, this book, uh, Logical Chess Move by Move, came up often as a book that was good for uh, club players, uh, players who were trying to uh, learn uh, not only tactics, but positional play. Uh, and, and this is what attracted me to the book, the fact that uh, some books, they give you a position and they say, okay, this is move 15. And I would sit there wondering, how did they even get here? Uh, whereas logical chess move by move gives uh, an explanation for every move uh, to tell the reader why 
uh, this player made this move? You know, why, why did the player go knight f3? Uh, and it was something that sometimes uh, you can give a, a few paragraphs on a move. Sometimes it can only be a few lines, but I found that very helpful. And uh, it was also helpful for me to learn the tabians of some of the openings because uh, very often club players, they want to learn an opening. They say, I want to learn the Karo Khan. So uh, they memorize, okay, there's this move, that move. Uh, and of course, when they're in a game and uh, the opponent goes out of book, then you're lost. So uh, when you explain the tabias and say, these are, uh, you know, these are the reasons for the moves, uh, that's more helpful. And that's what this book does as well. So I found this book to be excellent for uh, where I was at the time. And what I also found was that when I reread it the second time, after I had improved, there was still what to learn. So this is a book that can actually be helpful for multiple levels. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I, you know, I'm about probably the playing strength that Irving Chernev was. He was not a grandmaster. Um, Andy Soltis estimated his rating to be probably less than 2,100, although he did have the national master title, according to um, a bio that was written on the World Chess Hall of Fame website about him. They have a really cool tribute up to him um, that, uh, up on their site, that I re and of course at the museum, I'm sure, that I recommend people check out. He played in two U.S. championships, uh, 1942 and 1944. So obviously a pretty good player, especially for his era. But compared to all of these like super grandmasters and uh, elite trainers writing books, he came at it more from a scholarly angle. And I do want to echo your shout out to chess book collectors. I think there are over 30,000 members now, something crazy. Shout out to Brian Karen, their founder, um, friend of the podcast, as you mentioned. Um, and they gave you a great recommendation, Barry, because I've, I've commonly heard people say like, you know, there's all these moves and things that are supposed to be um, that some might consider basic. I don't know why they're doing it. And this book, again, I really love it. And I, I liked it even more revisiting it because, to be honest, it's not a book I would read on my own um, at this stage of my chess development if it weren't for doing this podcast. But I really appreciated it as like a chess content creator because he's such a good writer. Um, as as a, someone who teaches writing, Barry, what did you notice about reading it in terms of evaluating the way that uh, Irving Chernev writes? I love the fact that he used down-to-earth language and he even has a wit to him. Uh, not to say that uh, they were the funniest jokes I've ever seen, but right, right. It, does, it does keep you interested uh, because there are so many books, especially from that era, as you mentioned, that are written in such a dry manner uh, that you have to fight to stay awake just to get through. And that wasn't the case here. Uh, I thought the writing was excellent. And uh, it was, like I said, he, he made it interesting so that uh, you kept wanting to go on uh, to the next page. And uh, I know when we get to the quotations, uh, the reader is going to see what we mean by, uh, by his wit. Yeah, and we'll be sharing plenty of quotes um, as time goes on. Yeah, and of course, the reason he most likely is such a good writer is he's a true bibliophile. Um, I was also, of course, as we've mentioned on the podcast many times, it's so cool that U.S. Chess has their whole magazine archive online. So I was able to find like the original review um, in, 19, in 1958 of Logical Chess Move by Move, a couple tributes to Irving Chernev written over the years. And in one of them, he talked about his love for, for books generally and chess books in particular. He didn't seem like one prone to bragging, but he said at the time, and I believe this interview was in 1979, that he believed he'd, re he'd read more about chess than anyone ever. Um, and he talks in some of his interviews about the um, huge selection process in, in picking the games for this book um, and for his other books. Um, he's written, I believe it was 20 books. Um, and he just went through hundreds and hundreds of games. And remember, this is not the database age. He's doing this, you know, in the 1950s where you've got to just comb through book after book, go to libraries. And he didn't even do chess full time, which was quite surprising. Um, he worked in the paper industry. The details are a little vague on what exactly it was that he, he did. But he managed to write these 20 books many of them absolute classics, while, while working full-time in another field. And of course, this book and a few others were great sellers. Um, I, didn't, I didn't track down exact numbers, but again, the World Chess Hall of Fame said over 100,000 copies sold of this book, and it's still selling. I mean, and for good reason, and we should mention it's available on Kindle, which is how I read it. It doesn't seem to be available in any ebook um, that I can find, but as I mentioned in our previous podcast, um, my 
interview with Chris Callahan of Lee Chess. There is a Lee Chess Studies page where all, I think it's 33 games, have been uploaded. So if you Google Logical Chess Move by Move Lee Chess Study, you can play through it on the Lee Chess Study, play through the moves there, and then um, read the pros uh, by by its side, basically. Um, Barry, did you go with old school paperback or Kindle? How did you read this book? Uh, paperback. I'm old school, and uh, there's something about turning the pages. Uh, when I'm on the device, I could get distracted very easily. Uh, where that's not the case with the book. I also like the fact that if there's something in the book, I could open it to uh, where the page is. I know if it's somewhere toward the beginning, uh, toward the middle of the book. Uh, so I'm, I'm just not a big e-reader in general. That might just be a reflection of my age uh, or the fact that I'm old school. But uh, <laughs> I ordered it on Amazon, and uh, it's a very nice-looking book. And despite the fact that it was written in 1957, uh, like you said, the writing uh, still speaks to me today, and uh, it's it's one of these books that I plan to keep around and not to uh, sell it later on or, or give it away, because this is a book you can go back to over and over. Yeah, for sure. And and he's written, again, so many books, um, you know, and he's actually written a couple of my favorites um, in addition. So some of his other books, Winning Chess Traps, The Fireside Book of Chess. He had a book called Practical Chess Endings. Of course, there's also another book of that title by Paul Karras, um, a book called Chess, Chessboard Magic that I believe uh, Jen Shahadi mentioned um, as her having been a fan of um, in her formative years. A lot of endgame studies in that one, I believe. Um, and then The Most Instructive chess Games of Chess Ever Played, which is another one I really like and I find uh, quite good for newer players. And a book that I often recommend to more intermediate players, uh, Capablanca's Best Chess Endings. And I know that my friend Mike Klein, a.k.a. Fun Master Mike, also recommended that one. So he's got lots of classics. Barry, have you gotten a chance to dig into any of uh, Irving Chandler's other works yet? I have not, uh, but I look forward to getting to those. Uh, yeah, uh, Capablanca's uh, best endings, I think around 14, 1500. It's a great way to get your feet wet learning about endgames without being like a sort of manual. It's more just appreciating his genius. And I believe that Chernev mentioned Capablanca as who he considered to be the strongest player of all time. Um, and most instructive chess games ever played is just kind of like a natural follow up to uh, to logical chess move by move. Um so we've got a lot more to talk about with this book, but first we are going to take a break and hear from our friends at Chessable. This is your weekly reminder that Chessable.com has a ton of high quality material. Whether you're looking to learn a certain opening, want to see the latest Super GM repertoire that has been published, want to find a tactics course appropriate for your level, whatever it may be, go to Chessable.com and have a look around. Don't forget they have tons of cool free content too, like their short and sweet courses about various openings and all of the things that they offer feature their proprietary move trainer technology, the secret sauce that lets you actually remember all of the new chess moves and opening sequences that you learn. So once again, chessable.com, check out their ever expanding excellent library. And we are back and I think we're ready to dig deeper into the book. Um, Barry, you talked about how it, it's a good, um, it does a good job explaining opening tabias, like general uh, principles in, in common positions um, in a given opening. And that was one thing that struck me in rereading this book is it's kind of low key, just a really good sort of opening overview book. Um, it's got a decently wide variety of openings, although of course it's somewhat skewed by how old it is. Like you don't see, um, you know, you don't see a lot of Berlins or, or a lot of Grunfelds in it, but um, uh, some some Italians, some Kali systems, some Queen's Gambit declines, of course, and whichever opening it is that that he explains, he does a good job explaining the basic ideas. Did did you have a particular opening you were drawn to out of the ones in this, Barry? Well, the one that I found uh, interesting was uh, when he analyzed the Scandinavian defense, because uh, if you go through uh, the games that have those classic openings, like you mentioned. Uh, he emphasizes the so-called chess principles, uh, you know, get the knights out and then the bishops, don't move your pawns too much, castle, king safety, control the center, uh, don't move your queen before necessary. So here came an opening in which it's necessary to move your queen, uh, you know, in the second or third move. So I was curious to see how he would analyze that. Uh, now, in general, uh, that's, this is a point that uh, I mentioned 
uh, in the outline that uh, many of uh, his uh, games and the analyses uh, don't stand up to the engines. Uh, you know, this was written before they use chess engines. Uh, so uh, often the principles that he talks about uh, don't apply because the engines have found ways of uh, creating openings that uh, do uh, the opposite of what the principles say. Uh, so I thought that was interesting to see how he uh, kind of reconciles what he considers the importance of following the chess principles with openings that don't necessarily go along with chess principles. Yeah, it's a tricky subject. Like, um, I've read, I was just checking out uh, Grandmaster John Nunn's Understanding Chess Move by Move, um, just to have a sort of more holistic picture of the sort of move by move genre. And I know that every man chess has a move by move series, like Petrosian Move by Move. Uh, Spassky move by move, Karpov move by move. Although I really like those books, um, but they're not exact. They're not truly move by move. They skip over some books, and those are more intermediate level books. John Nunn tries to sort of follow in the footsteps of Irving Chernev, but he does kind of throw some shade at Chernev in the opening, um, in the intro. Um, even though he doesn't say it in those words, but he does sort of. He he alludes to John Watson's um, classic book where he talks about how as you say, rules are broken now by the top players. And John Nunn tried to pick um, pick books, pick games that were, were more even fights and that were more modern where some of the rules might be broken. And John Nunn says in, the, in his intro, like if you wanted to get medical advice, you wouldn't read a 50-year-old book. Um, but to me, it's, you know, you learn things in time. Um, as, as I talked about with I Am Willie Hendricks and as he sort of, laid out in On the Origin of Good Moves, um, the, the evolution of chess knowledge, your own personal journey in learning chess, will kind of follow the historical journey of what humans writ large have learned about chess. So I think if you're a newer player, it's fine to read an older book where, okay, everything might not be 100% accurate. Obviously, as you say, Barry, the engines are going to pick apart some of the lines, but for that stage in your development, you're not going to find better explanations. And the the openings in particular and something like someone being punished for um, for bringing their queen out early in the Scandi, shout out to uh, Greg Shahadi and John Bartholomew, who would either appreciate or not appreciate that, depending on which one you're discussing. Um, stuff like that is important to see. So I, I have no problems with the engine errors, I think, overall. And he's light on the analysis anyway. Um, even even lighter than John Nunn in his book. Like, it's really about explaining ideas. There's there's not many variations at all in this book. So did you, Barry, uh, so being that you used the book, did you play through variations or just kind of look at them when you were reading them? I did a little of both. Uh, in some games, I actually took out the board and went through them. Uh, there were other games where I looked, at, I looked up the games on uh, chess.com and I was able to find them and uh, see, as, as you uh, just noted, that there could be a move that Chernov uh, gives exclamation point to, which the engine says is an inaccuracy. Uh, but at the same time, I actually appreciate that he doesn't use the engine, even though it's true that, uh, you know, by today's standards, we would uh, look at the move uh, and the moves differently. Uh, but there's something to be said about not being married to the engine, and especially for club players uh, who sometimes become so obsessed with what the engine says, it's almost as though they turn their brains off and say, well, I, I have to do whatever the engine would say is a good move, even if it's uh, something that most humans would never think of in a million years. And yeah. uh, I know Judith Polgar on your, po on your podcast uh, uh, a couple of years ago said that when she was training, uh, she was glad that there were no engines because uh, had there been engines, uh, she probably wouldn't have made it because she used to uh, look at problems and try to figure out uh, the best way to solve them. And sometimes uh, she had to be quite creative. Uh, whereas if the engine would say, nope, this is not a good move, even though she thought it was great, then she probably would have gotten discouraged and said, forget about it. Yeah. And of course, she's famous for her creativity. Um, one of the most creative players of all time in terms of her ability to find uh, original moves. Um, yeah. And uh, I mean, of course, we should add he couldn't look at engines when he wrote this in 1957. But it's still a valid point that you raise because this book has been republished many times. I think the paperback I have a paperback version in addition to the Kindle 
but I think it was republished in the early 2000s. So they could have used engines then. And, you know, some publishers over the years have tried that with various books. But I think it's better just to leave it, leave it untouched, leave it in its original form. Now, Barry, one thing that you and I both found uh, um, inter- like worthy of discussion from this book is his treatment of uh, first moves. Um, <laughs> so I- I've got some things to say about this, but but Barry, first, what was your impression, the way he writes about like one E4 and then he writes a couple paragraphs and one D4 and so on? Okay, so he would. it's typical he would write something like, E4, this is a move that uh, puts the pawn in the center and also allows the bishop to get out. And it prepares for, and he does this every time. Uh, So after a while, you're thinking, okay, is it really necessary uh, by the 31st game to tell me why the player is doing E4 or D4? Uh, But at the same time, uh, he also tried to come up with uh, different points each time that he hadn't mentioned before, which is also quite impressive, if you ask me, to to do that. Uh, This way, it wouldn't be uh, as monotonous. So I do appreciate that he went through the effort to do that. Yeah, it's it's absolutely amazing. Um, in in the comedy world, they would call it committing to the bit because, like, by the seventeenth game, you're like, is he really going to go on for like three paragraphs about one e four? But he finds new things to say all the time. Um, so it's amazing to see. And I reading through some of the Amazon reviews, some people criticize that because there's some people were saying like there's there's a quote unquote only thirty three games in the book, but I find there to be plenty of content, like you say. You could read this more than once. I've read it more than once. Between just appreciating the games and the little insights he drops in, there, there's plenty to appreciate. But just to appreciate what I'm talking about, since obviously not everyone who, who listens to this is going to A, read the book or B, reread it or whatever. I just wanted to give a couple examples of like, he's so effusive about this, <laughs> about these moves. And to me, it's just kind of funny because, um, you know, more experienced chess players kind of take them for granted. So here he is. Here's one of his quotes about one E4. Um, he goes, and this is a quote, one of the best moves on the board. A pawn occupies the center and the two pieces are freed for action. 150 years ago, the great Philidor said, the game cannot be better open than by advancing the E-pawn two squares. That advice is still good today. Only one other white first move, one D4, releases pieces at the same time. So that's one quote. Then another different game where someone plays one E4, he says, values were constant in many fields at Endeavor of Endeavor at the time this game was played. Stories began once upon a time. Tic-tac-toe players put a cross in the central squares. Checker masters started with 11-15. He's also a checkers master and wrote a book about it, by the way. Um, chess, chess masters opened with one E4. Despite the researches of the scientists, these remain good beginnings. And then there's also a few Englishes thrown into the, the mix and not as many, but when discussing the move C4, which was reasonably rare back then, he says, despite the fact that only one move is one piece is freed by this move against the two that are released by E4 or D4, the English is one of the strongest opening weapons in White's arsenal that appeals to those who like originality right from the start as it allows maneuvering of the pieces without coming to grips too early with the enemy. In many forms of this opening, White doesn't even try to occupy the center. He lights black. He lets black mass pawns and pieces there and then attacks them from the side um, and goes on to explain some opening principles. So I really enjoyed it. And he's equally effusive about both E4 and D4. So it's uh, pretty funny to listen to or read rather. It's like uh, saying, well, E4 is the best move, except when you play D4. Yeah, and he has it broken down by half. Like the first half is about E4. So the first half he's raving about E4, and then the second half he goes on to rave about D4. But in his defense, I mean, obviously they're both um, they're both good moves. And that, that calls to mind his quote about picking a first move, which I found this to be like genuine, genuinely good evergreen advice, where he's talking about how someone should approach picking an opening. He says, uh, which move is better? Which move should you play? The answer is play the move that you like, the one that best suits your style and temperament. If you're a careful, cautious player who knows the full value of a pawn, that each one is a potential queen, and that the loss of a pawn may be the loss of the game, um, stick to uh, the openings of positional chess, the Roy Lopez, the Queen's Pawn openings, the Ready, and the English. On the other hand, if you prefer daring, adventurous chess, and a pawn is simply a barrier to the sweeping onrush of an attack by your pieces, play openings which allow scope for your imagination. 
the Evans, the Danish, the Kings, and other gambits. The best openings to play are the ones you're most at home in. Yeah, when I put together quotes for the book, I, I had the same one that you had chosen. I thought that was dynamite, uh, just really good advice. And um, you know the way it's presented, uh, as you say, is so clear and so straightforward. Uh, it almost uh, raises the question, what's there not to like uh, about his yeah. writing? Yeah, well, again, I guess some people might say it's a little repetitive. But the other thing is, like, I feel like there's an enthusiasm that can't be faked, you know, um, because some stronger players might get tired of uh, writing about these these moves that often we're sort of on autopilot when we play. But he really finds original things to say. Um, I, I just have to read a couple more examples because it really struck me when I rereading this book. So here he is describing the move to knight f3 in a double king pawn opening. So, you know, e4, pawn to e4, pawn to e5, and now white's going knight to f3, attacking the pawn. And he goes, he writes, absolutely the best move on the board, exclamation point. The knight develops with a threat, attack on a pawn. This gains time as black is not free to develop as he pleases. He must save the pawn before he does anything else. And this cuts down his choice of reply. The knight develops towards the center, which increases the scope of his attack. The knight exerts pressure on two of the strategically important squares in the center, e5 and d4. The knight comes into play early in the game in, com in compliance with the precept, develop knights before bishops. And lots of exclamation points in there. Um, and then another time he describes two knight f3 as, you, play, you may play this move confidently, secure in the knowledge that no master alive can make a better move. Um, so just just amazing enthusiasm, but again, it it seems uh, seems very uh, genuine to me. He has some good analysis of the French defense, like explaining sort of the unique characteristics of uh, the pawn breaks, especially in the advanced French. Um, so there's just so much good opening treatment, and a lot of the games are fairly short, you must say. So it's good that he's he's good about discussing the openings. Yeah, for sure, and and like you said. He the, his love of chess just oozes out onto the paper, and, and there's really no denying that. Yeah, and if you read, I, having read some of his interviews now, it's interesting to hear him. He was just an appreciator of chess, so he's kind of lamenting in some of the interviews that um, that everyone always is just looking for ways to gain rating points, and he tells a story, actually, of even trying to show a game to, I believe it was Al Yekin, uh, former world champion, um, or it was a game of Al Yekin to another top player. I apologize, I can't remember who it was. But the 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 person didn't want to see the combination that ended. He's just like, oh, White's winning. There's nothing to see here. And he just he just wanted to appreciate the beauty of chess and appreciate every move. And he he lamented that a lot of people um, didn't share his um his almost unmatchable enthusiasm uh, for chess. Um, so, Barry, did you have any other, like, uh, quotes or highlights that particularly stood out to you in, in reading Logical Chess Move by Move? Yeah, so I pulled a couple of quotes that I just think show his wit that, that we've been talking about. Uh, and sometimes this is uh, more effective as, you know, uh, Andres, uh, who was it, the, the one from Andres Australia? Tom, Tom yeah. right? uh, He mentions that sometimes when you come on a little bit harder, uh, it's more memorable than if you just say, well, this wasn't your greatest move. Uh, so there's one uh, there's one uh, quotation on page 15 after the move H3. Now, one thing about Chernov is he hated any sort of pawn moves in front of the king. Uh, now, we know that uh, today, uh, very often, openings will say that uh, H3 is part of the repertoire. But in those days, uh, that was like a big no-no. So uh, the player moved H3, and he writes, a coffee house move. <laughs> exclamation right. point. Weak players make this move instinctively in dire dread of having a piece pinned. It is better to submit to the pin a temporary inconvenience than to prevent it by a move that loosens the position of the pawns defending the king and weakens the structure permanently. Yeah, that's a great quote. And I was just, we were just discussing that sort of in a, one of my adult chess classes, that sort of natural desire for the, the safety of preventing that pin or giving the king, the castled king, the escape square. But um, often it's sort of a, a false comfort that can, as Chernev alludes to, um, e create more problems than it solves. Although these things are tricky. I mean, because obviously 
um, you often see H3 at the top level. Um, Geary in the candidates, we're recording this in the middle of the candidates tournament. He unveiled this move H3 when his king was already a little open on G2. Um, he unveiled this new move that that uh, the announcers, Magnus Carlsen, Tanya Sachdev, and David Howell thought was uh, a great new concept. So again, it gets tricky because as you get higher on the rating ladder, you kind of have to forget some of these rules. But as I was telling my students, um, it's if you just in a vacuum look at uh, newer players playing H3 or H6, it's more likely to be unnecessary than necessary. So good advice on Irving Chernev's part. And uh, Barry, I know that you also highlighted that this chart that uh, Chernev had about the mobility of the pieces. Do you want to tell us a little bit about that? Right. So at one point, he wanted to emphasize uh, that if you can get your pieces into a certain position, uh, you can control a lot more squares. And uh, he showed uh, at some point in the game, uh, he made a chart with how many pieces each, uh, how many squares each piece can move. And uh, he wrote, for example, for white, the king can move two. Uh, whereas black, the king can only move one. The queen for the white has 12 squares, the black has five, and so on and so forth. And the total is uh, for white, 42, and for black, 17. And his point was that peace mobility is a, a tremendous aspect of uh, winning chess games. So this is something that I don't know the club players would look at, uh, you know, if this weren't pointed out to them, because they might just be concerned about tactics and, and trying to get uh, the best position possible to attack, uh, whereas he's making this point, which I know is, is not something that a player could do if he's playing blitz or maybe even rapid, but in uh, classical chess, uh, to just sit back and say, where can I move my pieces so that they'll have greater scope? Uh, I think that's tremendously helpful advice. Yeah, and he does, and that's... um symbolic of his overall ability to break down chess into sort of its core components and explain things on a very understandable level. And I haven't seen, you know, stuff like that does not get emphasized as much as it should of just like why we have these precepts. Um, so yeah, just, uh, it, it's really cool to put it in chart form and just show like where different pieces on different squares, the, uh, the number of, of squares that they can go to. Um, so we might share a few more quotes, and we've definitely got a couple favorite games to talk about. But first, let's uh, take a break and hear from our friends at Aim Chess. Not every chess player has a janitor to help them improve at chess like Beth Harmon did. For those of you who don't, there is AimChess.com. Aim Chess has a web-based algorithm that collects and analyzes your games from Chess.com or Lee Chess, and then it creates personalized study plans based on your weaknesses to help you improve. It might highlight specific openings to work on, tell you to tighten up your tactics, or in my case, tell me to manage my time better. Then it gives you puzzles and advice with the goal of helping you improve your chess faster. You can check out Aim Chess for free. And then if you decide to subscribe, please use the promo code CHESS30 to save 30%. That's CHESS30. The details are also in the show notes. So for now, let's get back to the interview. Okay, so we've got, again, he's such a good writer. We want to share some more quotes. So Barry, um, would you like to uh, share another uh, quote that struck you from Logical Chess Move by Move? Yeah, so this is from page 37. Uh, this is uh, Player Castle and Chernov did not approve of the move. So he writes, Pillsbury gave us his rule, which he said was absolute and vital. Castle because you want to or because you must, not because you can. So I'm reading this and I'm thinking, okay, uh, in earlier games you mentioned the importance of king safety and how important it is to castle. So here we have somebody who castles and you're saying, no, don't do it. It's a bad move. So uh, this is, again, the part that I find confusing sometimes. Well, I guess if you're not looking at the context enough uh, to understand why in some cases it's appropriate, in some cases not. But if you take everything he says as gospel and king safety, you have to castle. Uh, then you say, he's telling us that we should castle except for when we shouldn't. You know, yeah. How does that help? Uh, and, and of course, when you look at it in a more nuanced manner, you realize that, well, the circumstances in this game uh, did not call for castling. In this case, it was actually detrimental. 
So uh, the problem is that if you take what he says as gospel when it comes to the principles, then you engage in what Dan Heisman, I know he was another guest of yours, uh, calls hand-waving, uh, right. which is the idea of, okay, the chess principles tell me to do this. <laughs> Whether or not it makes sense, uh, we still have to do that. So uh, I thought that was interesting. And, and that's why uh, these games have to be read, not just you know, 11 o'clock at night when you're about to go to sleep, just flipping through it. It has to be done in an active way where uh, you go through the sidelines and you know he explains sometimes why why this move was made and not some other move that maybe looked more logical. Uh, because if you do that, then this, that's going to lead to this and that and the other. Uh, and then you're going to be down in exchange or something to that effect. Yeah, hearing you, when you launched into that quote, I was thinking, oh, that's going to get some players in trouble because now they're going to use that as an excuse to uh, delay castling. But yeah, it's it's kind of like a catch-22, as you allude to. Um, you'll read one thing that says castle, one thing that says don't castle. But again, to echo what I was saying about the desire to play H3, um, I see I see more mistakes made where a player delays castling at the uh, novice to intermediate level than I do uh, where they castle too soon. Now, that doesn't mean that it wasn't applicable in this particular case, but as you say, Barry, that's what makes chess hard, and that's why you have to be actively engaged and asking yourself questions yourself and not, not doing uh, hand-waving, as uh, my friend Dan Heisman uh, aptly mm -hmm. termed, um, you know, just relying on uh, heuristics without uh, thinking for yourself about a, a given move. Um, I mean, how many of your students uh, ask you, you know, when you tell them, hey, you didn't castle and you got into trouble, how many of them say, well, I was watching a game with Fabiano and he didn't <laughs> castle. So I thought if Fabiano doesn't have to castle, neither do I. Yeah, it's not so much that um, as it's just a comfort thing. Uh, I think when newer players are, are playing chess, it's a, they're very governed by their emotions and their, their comfort levels. And... Um, it's kind of easy to think of what can go wrong because you've seen a lot of attacks against a castled king and there's a perceived flexibility in waiting to see what your opponent does before you castle. So I think often, often that's the issue of it being so committal. Um, but again, I think uh, uh, players might often be better served as just thinking of it as automatic. And yes, you might get attacked, but if you're, if you're thinking proactively about what your opponent's going to do, um, you, you, and you have like a solid foundation, not a lot of pawns moved in front of your king more often than not, not always, um, then you should be okay. Right. And, uh, there's another quotation, uh, that talks about, uh, what we might call weird openings or unusual ones. Uh, this is on page 81 and he writes, even the greatest masters do not play startling, bizarre, or brilliant moves in the opening brilliant in quotation marks in an effort to be different or to impress others with their ability to find extraordinary moves in commonplace positions, they are content to develop their pieces quickly, placing them on squares where they will operate to greatest effect and then wait for nature to take its course. Uh, now, this was obviously written before Eric Rosen's time. Uh, he's known for his uh, whacked out openings. Uh, but like you say, for the club player, uh, this is good advice. You know, stick to the tried and the true and then once you reach a certain level, if you want to go out there and, and do some uh, crazy stuff, then okay. Uh, but you do that at the club level, uh, more often than not, you'll get destroyed. Yeah, and, and in one of the interviews I read with him, he talked about how, again, how the rigorous selection process for picking the games for this. And he was really he was really looking for games that didn't have a lot of fireworks that were just like one side made a few mistakes that you can expect at the club level. And the other player is able to take advantage, as you say, sort of the natural um, nature taking its course, take advantage of these mistakes. And he did an amazing job selecting the games. Now, again, I, I've heard a few people critique the game selection for a, a couple reasons. Number one, these aren't like, as as well-known games, I mean, there's a couple famous, there's a few famous games in here, but a lot of them are players that are not household chess names by any means. But I think it's because he he wanted it to be, like he picked the instructive quality of the game seemed to be his main criteria above all else. So I think that's perfectly reasonable. Um, I know that a lot of chess teachers like to use this book. I, I, especially when I was doing more 
you know, intermediate kids level classes, I would also use it. So it's hard to weave a story around these people you, you barely know anything about. So that is a minor mark against it. And again, John Nunn, I know he goes for more elite against elite type games, or at least grandmaster against grandmaster type games. But to me, it's all about the quality of the moves. And I, I think um, I think he did an amazing job picking these games. Yeah, and these were, many of these were grandmasters or, or close to it. So it wasn't as though he was uh, taking players who, who were rated a thousand or, or 1500. Uh, and often if you look at the games without the analysis and you're a club player, uh, it'll be hard to know uh, where exactly uh, the losing side went wrong. Uh, because uh, at these levels, uh, sometimes it's just the subtle move uh, that has the domino effect of, of really messing everything up later on. So I, I had no problem with the fact that some of these uh, were people I never heard of. That was fine with me because, uh, like you said, uh, he must have had a reason for choosing them. And, and the idea was, what can we learn from this game? Yeah, and actually, there are a lot of, uh, you know, famed great players. Like, there's a lot of Tarash games, a lot of Capablanca games, a couple of Pillsbury games. It's more that it's often a mismatch. It's often, like, one of the people they're playing is not um, on their level. But again, to me, that's not why you read this book. You read this book for the uh, instructive value of, of which uh, there is plenty. Um, Barry, did you have any other quotes you wanted to share? Yeah, I had one more. This was on page 161. Uh, this was after move six, which was night of three. Somewhere around the stage, the amateur wants things to happen. He begins to look around for surprise moves. There must be a brilliancy in this position, exclamation point. The great master in the same situation is content to make simple moves. He knows that if he keeps on bringing pieces into play, there will be no need to look for winning combinations. They will evolve naturally out of the position and spring up all over the place. Now, this is something I think uh, is very important for the club player to understand uh, because sometimes I'm watching, uh, back when my son would watch chess, we'd watch, we used to like to watch banter blitz where the GMs would play uh, players who were rated sometimes a thousand points lower. Uh, and one of our favorites to watch is Sam Shankland. And uh, there were times when he was playing someone who was rated, let's say, uh, on chess 24, 18, 1900, and he's rated about 3000. So you know that uh, unless something crazy happens, he'll win the game. And yet uh, he took his time. He set up his pieces uh, in a positional manner. It wasn't like uh, by move five, the game was over. Uh, so this uh, this is exactly what uh, Chernov is saying. Now my son would watch and say, "Hey, why doesn't he attack the queen with his bishop?" Uh, you know, which is maybe something that the club pair, player would look for. Uh, but the grandmasters know that that's not going to be the most effective move, especially if there are ways to defend it. And all you're doing is uh, you know setting yourself back a few uh, tempi. So uh, the way they do it, even against uh, much lower rated players, is to be patient and to take their time, uh, and eventually, uh, as Churn of Rights, it will happen. If you do a good job and you set up your pieces the right way, uh, you'll get to that point where, uh, assuming you don't blunder, of course, uh, where you'll be able to go in for the kill. Yeah, well said. And yeah, and again, he, he specifically selected games that weren't like tactical melees. And honestly, um, just for the format of the book, I think he wanted it to be instructive uh, for sort of positional ideas in particular, but also just for the format of the book, like reams of analysis just wouldn't really fit in with what he's trying to achieve with the uh, move by move format. In fact, again, just to sort of uh, address head on some of the common critiques you might see of this book, some people just said there's like, there's no analysis. Um, and it is, it is pretty light in terms of, um, of how many variations uh, are in the book, but Again, the target audience is people who are not generally calculating, uh, you know, five moves in advance. So he may simplify some of the concepts so that someone like a, uh, a Capablanca or a Tarash uses. But I think it's for the, the greater good of, of uh, helping people understand um, the basics, um, which brings me to my f I mean, there were, again, a lot of favorite games I could have picked, um, especially being a Capablanca fan uh, like Irving Chernev was. 
Um, but I think my favorite is is one that is a re- rather well known game, uh, Rubenstein Solway, um, which is just a beautiful positional squeeze. A lot of people consider it like a canonical how to exploit a backward pawn um, game. And of course, I, I recommend listeners get this book. I think it's ten bucks on Kindle. Again, these these Kindle books in particular are always a steal, and the paperback is inexpensive as well. Um, or you could just play through the moves on chess games or the Lee Chess Study. But here's just one quote talking about a position where uh, it's you know it's going to be hard to explain in a podcast. But basically, um, Rubenstein puts his bishop on e3, kind of binding, uh, locking wa- black's pawns on white squares rather than putting it on a sort of more natural move, uh, natural square that one might hand wave and put it on. So this is what uh, Chernev writes. He says. You would expect the bishop to go to f4, where its range is long and where it does not obstruct the e-pawn's movements. Or you might consider it consider g5, where it, pla- where it cramps black's games. These are good and natural moves, but they do not fit in with the strategic concept governing this position. Once there is a definite logical plan to follow, we must play moves that conform to that plan so that the improvement of our position or the undermining of the opponents is conducted systematically and not as a result of accidental circumstances. Development at this point must not be carried out for its own sake. Um, so again, gets to this principle of really engaging your brain and not just automatically doing something because you saw, you read in a book or you saw a chess YouTuber um, you know, spout a certain principle. And yeah, for sure. Sorry, go ahead, Barry. No, I, I completely agree. Um, and you already mentioned, I think your favorite game was, was one of the Tarash uh, Scandinavian games, Barry. Yes, I enjoyed yeah. that a lot. Yeah, and we should have mentioned earlier for, for whom this, like for what rating uh, this this book is most appropriate. So, so Barry, what's, what's your, uh, you're mostly online, right? Right. And, and what are your online ratings, if you don't mind saying? So I'm about 1,300 uh, on chess.com. Now, I know that doesn't sound like any great shakes, especially relative to uh, many of the guests you've had. But considering that when I started playing in uh, November 19, I was about 500. Uh, so I think that's pretty good. And Yeah, uh, it's, uh, it's I, great. I would, and... yeah, I would love to get better, but uh, you know, with my full-time job and... Uh, with my children, I, I don't have the luxury of just locking myself in a room with uh, books and and the boards and, and just spending eight hours a day uh, going through uh, you know tactical positions and, and so on and so forth. Yeah, and f- four kids is no joke. So <laughs> it's great that you uh, find it's it. True. Great that you find any time for chess. Yeah, and I think that around thirteen hundred, fourteen hundred, it's uh, and lower. I should say, like. Uh, 800 to 1400 i would say is sort of the ideal audience for this book but again rereading it um as a content creator in particular with sort of that lens and um you know someone who really enjoys reading just appreciating his writing those were the two things that stood out to me but also the game selection really stands the test of time so the the common critiques you might hear from more advanced chess fans um, I think obviously they have some merit, but overall, I I was I enjoyed this book. Rereading it, I enjoyed it more than I expected to, and it wasn't close. Um, I would say so. Um, improvement takeaways. What what? So Barry, being sort of uh, right in the target audience for this book, what what were the uh, what struck you most? What did you take away from reading this book? Uh, the the takeaways that I got from the book uh, were. Uh, first and foremost, the idea of being patient. And, uh, you know, like I said earlier, uh, there's a tendency among club players to uh, just want to go for the attack right out of the gate. Uh, as Ben Feingold would say, raw, <laughs> uh, right away, just uh, start, uh, you know, attacking all the other pieces and, and trying to do something. And uh, more often than not, when you go with that approach, it doesn't work if the opponent knows what he or she is doing. So, uh, so this book shows you that it's not just about coming up with the tactic because, uh, as you said, these uh, are games that uh, don't feature tremendous blunders or, or amazing tactics that were thought of 15 moves in advance. Uh, this is just uh, with good, solid play, uh, you know, and, and not blundering, 
you could uh, get yourself into a position to win more often than not. Uh, so, uh, you know, sometimes we watch these banter blitz uh, type programs or any of these uh, you know, streams of uh, IMs and GMs playing, and especially when they're playing uh, blitz, uh, we might tend to think that, uh, you know, the, the idea is to just uh, attack, attack, attack. Uh, but that's not the way to go, uh, especially at a club level, um, now, unless uh, unless the opponent is not going to know how to uh, respond. I mean, that's why sometimes the tricky openings work. But uh, very often, if you know how to handle the gambits, uh, all that means is that uh, the you know, the opponent is down a pawn and uh, might be on the run. So uh, I think patience was uh, one of the takeaways. Another takeaway. Uh, that I got, and I think this is also important for club players because uh, players who are above 1,400 probably know this already, but I know that many of your listeners are coaches, so this is something uh, they can share. And that is uh, that when it comes to evaluating positions and seeing who's in the lead and who who's better, uh, club players often get caught up in uh, looking at the material advantage and thinking, I'm a pawn down or I'm an exchange down or, uh, you know, something like that and think that's it, it's over. And that can have a psychological effect on them where they just throw in the towel and uh, don't really think about uh, the best moves they can make. Uh, Whereas here we find sometimes that a a player could be down a piece or could sacrifice the exchange uh, and be in a better position because it's possible for a good bishop to be better than a bad rook. Uh, and that's not something that comes easily to the club player because the club player just sees, wow, he's got two rooks and I have a rook and a bishop. Uh, I must be in bad shape. But depending on the other circumstances of the board, uh, you could be doing fine, uh, maybe even better. So I think that's something that uh, he emphasizes in the book and uh, when you look at these positions carefully and he explains why, despite being down the exchange or being down a point or two, uh, you know, this player is still better. Uh, I think that's something that can really help the club player uh, really understand the bigger picture and that it's not just uh, you know, being played in a vacuum. They have to look at the context. Yeah, and that's something that it only becomes more important as you become more advanced. I've talked in the past about how even I, I feel like I'm too materialistic as well. Like you, you know, you get anchored to the the point values and chess is a much more dynamic game than that. And if anything, the, uh, the, the super engines are showing that to be more true than ever. Like anyone who watched uh, the, the round eight of the candidates where, uh, Fabiano through the kitchen sink at, at MVL, just sacked piece after piece straight, you know, straight off the computer, blitzing out the moves. Um, can see just just how fluid uh, point values can be. Um, I had a few uh, few things I wanted to highlight that I felt were helpful improvement takeaways as as well. Uh, number one, he's constantly emphasizing the mobility of pieces as we discussed. Um, number two, simplify when ahead. Again, these are like the sort of core core precepts of chess, but still he's got good examples that show these ideas in action. And he, he had a great quote where, um, well, it's self-explanatory. So I'll read this quote about uh, how a certain game ended. He says, the reason the master didn't see the shorter line is that he was not looking for it in the first place. This was a faster way to win. The move with which he wins is the one whose effects he foresaw earlier and analyzed thoroughly before starting the final combination. Once the series of forcing moves clicks, there is no reason at all for him to waste time finding other moves that might win. It takes time to analyze combinations and the shorter way, ventured on hurriedly, might turn out to have a hole in it. The moral is play. So I found that to be really good advice as well. You don't need to like find the fastest checkmate. If you know what you're doing and you have things under control, that's the place to be. Um, and then lastly, again, he's good at giving advice sort of for how to find your chess style. Um, And here he writes, the first piece of advice I would offer to the young student who wishes to improve his chess is that in the formation of the style, he should try to follow his own aptitude and temperament. One player derives pleasure in working a game out accurately like a sum in mathematics. Another cares for nothing but ingenious combinations and brilliant attacks. It is by far the best for each to develop his own qualities. 
And of course, these pronouns, you know, now you might say her qualities or his or her, but I'm just quoting what the book says. Um, so yes, so much wisdom here for, for club players. Um, hearty recommendation. Uh, Barry, do you have any other books that you read that, that you would place on the same pedestal? Uh, I read uh, Dan Heisman's uh, book, uh, I forgot what it's called, something about the amateur, where he does something similar. Now, he doesn't analyze every move, so he, he might give the first uh, five, six moves without analysis, uh, and then he'll give uh, analysis when he sees a, a key move, uh, whether it's uh, the best move or whether it's uh, you know, not the best move and what the player should have done. Uh, I wish I would remember the name, but... Uh, that used the engine because it was written much more recently. Uh, but I found that these move my, by move books in general are helpful. And I did take a look at John Nunn's book. I don't own it, uh, but I have seen it. And uh, he does give a little bit more analysis per move than uh, Irving Chernov. And it is, uh, of course, with more, uh, a more diverse uh, group of openings. So uh, those who like the, uh, the more positional ones the ones who like the open or the closed, uh, there's something for everyone there. Uh, so I, I just enjoy these types of books, especially because I'm an amateur myself. So uh, I'm always wondering, what is it that makes this move bad when uh, logically it looks like a good move and it looks like it's developing a piece and it looks like it's uh, you know, uh, attacking at some point. And then there's an explanation as to why it isn't a good move. Uh, so I appreciate uh, those types of books. Uh, but uh, the books that uh, I get sometimes, and like you mentioned, the Move by Move books uh, or Capablanca Move by Move, uh, those are very often above my pay grade. And I don't know that there's uh, much to gain for a player in the 1300 range reading a book that's meant for the 2000s. Although I know that uh, Cyrus, uh, your buddy has been on a couple of times, uh, who's written a million books, uh, says that the trend seems to be now that the books uh, are being written more toward the club player than for the uh, grandmasters, uh, perhaps because there are more resources online for the grandmasters, so they don't need the books. Uh, I'm not sure why that is, or maybe it's just uh, there's more of a market for the improving players. Uh, so so it's, it's tough because uh, the books that like Chess for Dummies are great if you're just starting out. Uh, where they teach you what a pin is and, and what a skewer is. Uh, but once you've gone beyond that, but you're not at the level where you can uh, take these books that, that show a million variations and, and your head is spinning, uh, you know, to hit that sweet spot here, there are, uh, at least uh, from what I've seen, a ton of these types of books. Uh, so this is one of them. And, and I really appreciate that I was able to find this and uh, kudos to those in the uh, chess book collectors group who uh, recommended it, despite the fact that uh, one of the members uh, sent me a 40 page uh, criticism uh, that he had of why uh, Chernov's uh, analysis was wrong. But again, that's in hindsight and that's with, uh, with the use of engines. But, but again, yeah. to find that sweet spot for somebody in my level is not easy. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, most, most 1,300, 1,400 players would love to make the quote-unquote mistakes that, that people are criticizing. You know, like, the, the, the air, they're not hanging pieces, you know, in the game. So if they make a mistake, it's like an air quote, again, advanced mistake. Um, so yeah, the, those criticisms, especially, I mean, you've got to give the guy credit. He wrote this book in 1957 um, or published this book in 1957. So yeah, they just don't ring true to me. And, you know, following on what we mentioned about understanding chess move by move, John Nunn's book, I think that might be a good follow-up to this book. Although again, I haven't read the whole thing either. I just bought it on Kindle right before we were recording. Um, but obviously it's more advanced and obviously John Nunn's reputation precedes him as an amazing author. So I'm not sure what level it's for, but, um, you know, there's a, there's a place for, for both books for sure. The other thing I did want to add, Barry, I looked up uh, Dan Heisman's book title. It's the, the world's most instructive amateur game book. Yeah, and, that's uh, the one. and of course, all of Dan Heisman's stuff is great. He's got a YouTube channel and his other books are very relatable. Um, he's, he's great at uh, understanding the thinking of... Um, of club level players. Um, so just a few things before we, we wrap up, uh, Barry, 
Um, so we we address some of the critiques. I don't have any others uh, except for the usual. I do wish there were a a proper um, a proper ebook, but other than that, I think that any criticism you see, in my opinion, is um, is kind of overblown. Um, and the monthly donation, Barry. So I was messaging you about this this morning. And wh where do you stand on uh, on making some sort of a chess chess related donation? So uh, the Perpetual Chess Podcast. I've heard uh, of it. <laughs> uh, is that acceptable? I guess. I mean, we were going back and forth on this. I thought maybe I would pick something. So I'll think about it. Barry's been adamant that he wants to give it to support the podcast. So I appreciate that, Barry, in any event. And maybe I could put it towards a new Kindle or something because my I've got some super old Kindle and the book library is full. So I'm constantly del deleting books every time I buy one. Um, so may maybe I'll put it towards that. And I, I appreciate it, Barry. All right. My pleasure. Keep up the good work. Thank you. Yeah. And um one other housekeeping note before we wrap up, or I guess two others. Um, there's not going to be a, a blindfold puzzle. Um, again, if if it's a big deal to you, reach out to me. But generally, it seems like people are kind of um, there. There is other stuff um, that you can do to work on visualization. So I might drop it in on the next one, but I haven't gotten around to it for this one. Um, and the next uh, book recap it should be a banger. Um, we're going to bring in my my online friend, FM Nate Solon. He's got a chess email list that you guys should all subscribe to. Um, super sharp guy, very strong player. And what we're going to do is we're actually going to discuss the two Zurich 1953 books, the one by, Zer by uh, Neidorf and the one by Bronstein. Now, this is a large scale project. This is uh, two, two classics, two big books. So this is going to take two months. So that will be out in June, but I'm excited for it. I haven't read the Nidorf one. I have read the Bronstein one in my formative years, but not since. And just so many classic games in that candidates tournament. Um, and love the chess history and the educational value. And that's one that should appeal to a wide range of, uh, of listeners and readers. Um, Okay, so Barry, thanks again. This has been great. Um, do you are you reachable by anyone who wants to reach out? I know we got a big chess community in New York. So, um, do you want to make your information public or keep it private? No, that's fine. Uh, my email address is I am I A M Barry Katz B A R R Y K A T Z at gmail dot com. Awesome. And Barry, you mentioned you're mostly online. Do you ever make your way to the Marshall Chess Club or any of the other New York haunts? So I haven't. I actually just noticed because uh, I was looking at uh, you know, chess clubs nearby. There's one in Brooklyn. Uh, I'm not sure if it's still functional because the website looks like it hasn't been updated since 1998. So <laughs> I'll standard. To, yeah, I'll have to call them to see if that's uh, still uh, in effect, but uh, you know, the problem is that I got into it, and then a couple of months later, COVID hit, and a lot of these places uh, were closed. And I know that now some of them are reopening, so I have to find out uh, which ones are open, and uh, at some point, make my way there. Okay. Uh, well, yeah. well, being that being that I'm only an uh, hour and a half from New York, one of these days we might do a perpetual chess New York meetup, Barry. So maybe I can wrangle you for that. Uh, oh, for sure. Sign me up. Okay. Sounds good. All right. Well, Barry, thanks. This has been a lot of fun. Really appreciate all the time. I know you're super busy. So, um, so thanks for, thanks for chipping in and, um, uh, hopefully we'll meet in person someday. Yes, hopefully. Thanks as always to my producer, Matthew Passy. Thanks to you all for listening. And thanks to those of you who help spread the word, whether it be positive reviews on podcast platforms, telling friends, social media, all that stuff helps get the word out and it is much appreciated. By the way, you can follow me on Twitter. I'm at BennyFischel1. You can join the Perpetual Chess Facebook group to continue the conversation, sometimes even with that week's guests. The Perpetual Chess Instagram page is back in action as well at Perpetual Chess. And you can also find all these links on the Perpetual Chess webpage, perpetualchesspod.com. But of course, the main purpose of these closing credits is to thank everyone who supports Perpetual Chess financially. Without you all, we would not be able to put out such a consistent and hopefully quality product. 
So thanks so much. It really means the world to me. And in particular, I would like to give thanks to the following people and entities, starting off with my friends at chessable.com. Aside from that, I would like to thank David Lazarus of lasmanchess.com. He is the coach of Dave's Young Tigers on Lee Chess, our friends at Quality Chess Books, the Capital City Chess Club, the Abysmal Depths of Chess blog, Adapta Interactive Web Designs and Services, the Apprend Chess Twitch channel, A Needy Deer, Austin Clough, Benjamin Porto, Bill Sigler, Kathy Carr, Chad Oliver, the Charlotte Chess Center, the Chess Central's Chess blog, chessmood.com, Chris Flanagan, Chris Lott, Dan O'Hanlon, Daniel He, Danny Davidson, David Schreiber, I am Dimitri Schneider, I am Eric Rosen, Eric Tam, Ewan Richardson, Farhan Thawar, Faraz Sawaf, Gary Foreman, Glenn Downing, Greg Harfst, Greg Shahadi, Gregory Gullick, Guvin Manet, James Holyhead, James Kennedy, Jeff Martinson, Jens Green, Jeremy Nielsen, John Jernigan, John Rockefeller, John Mac- MacArthur, Kelly Palmer, Kevin O'Callaghan, King Selt, the King's Crusher YouTube channel, one of the original chess YouTube channels, Lucio Casada Silva, the law offices of Stuart Katz, Matthew Feeney, Michael Can, FM Michael Oblin, Mike Zelazny, Mr. Mike Shahadi, the legendary Mr. Dodgy, the Nerd Nays Twitch channel, GM Peter Prohaska, Peter Sodhi, the Play More Chess Academy of the Hamden Chess Club, Reuven Fisher, Reverend Roy Fry, the Seattle Chess Club, Shane Unger, Stefan Kelty, Stephen Martinez, Sven Gearson, Thomas Stanix, Thomas Tachenko, Todd Bryant of Strong Chess, Todd Kennedy, the Vintage Patsers, which is a chess.com improver group. You can look them up. Wayne Beam, William Hogarth, and I also would like to thank Aaron Waffler, Ace Viega, Adam Ralph of ChessEngland.com, Adrian Gutierrez, Al Hastings, Alan and Maggie Sue, Alex Pejas, Alexander Markovic, Antonio Cancino, FM Andre Tarakov, Dr. Andrew Perry, Angus McLeod, Barry Hessian, Bill Juniper, Bill Moran, Bill Trammell, Brad and Andy Rosen, Brett Howard Lynn, Brian Chase, Brian Mullis, Bruce Scott, Brian Tillis of Palm Beach Chess, Cameron Davis, Chad Hilton, Chess Pots or Spain, Dr. Charles Snodgrass, Chris Wainscott, Christopher Baumgartner, Christopher Chabri, Christopher Wood, I am Christoph Zalecki, also known as Chess Explained, Coach Jay's Chess Academy, Corey Butson, Costa Carras, Courtney Fry, Craig Mallon, Daniel Ginsberg, Daniel Naylor, Dave Saylor, David Bleskacek, David Brown, David Hamblin, David Cramley, Dalen Shelton, Dennis Parrish, Dirk Decker, FM Donnie Ariel, Dwayne Edmonds, Ed Daly, Ed Mead, Emmanuel Langual, Robitai, Ethan Smith, Hallelujah Cat, Ian Mason, Fide Arbiter, Arbiter, Arbiter excuse me, Felipe Melo Perdera, Fox Valley Chess Club, Francis Letart Lavoie, Frank Tor- Dr. Frank Tortoris, Frank Zanani, Gary Andrews, Gary Lewis, Gautam Narula, Geert Vandervelde, Gene Stewart, George Harris, Giovanni Russo, Han Shoot, Harish Srinivasan, Howard Vihan, Jacob Kovac, Jason Apollo, Jason Murray, Jacques Pari, James Aspinwall, James Benastia, James Muir, Jason Woolham, J. Deep Chakrabarty, Jeff Anderson, Jeffrey Martello, Yep Hoyland, Jerry Wells, Jesse DeCumos, Jesse McNulty, Jim Ratliff, Joe DeSano, Joe Valdez, Joel Thomas Ramos, John Tooley, Juan Almaguar, Dr. John Fallon, John Fernandez, John Fontaine, John Hartman of U.S. Chess, John Jeffrey, John McMurtry, Jonathan Slater, John Quist, John Tully, Jose Rodriguez, Justin Gardner, Jen Shahadi, Joel Rocky, John Thompson, GM Josh Friedel, I am Kare Christensen, WGM Katarina Nemsova, Kelly Palmer, Kevin Pryor, I am Kostya Kovutsky of the Chess Dojo, Krishna Gopala Krishnan, Kyle McAvoy, Larry Cook, Larry Ryforth, Laura Belyovsky, Macaulay Peterson, Mark Fitzpatrick, Mark Miller, Mark Wilkins, Marco Bulatovic, Martin Knudsen, Martin Krug, Matthew Passy, Matthew Tedesco of SeattleChessMeetup.org, Matthias Plock, Mechanics Institute Chess Club of San Francisco, Michael Allard, Michael Hudson, Mike Clem, Mitchell Fabian, Nate Goble, Nate Solon, Neil Bruce, 
Nigmat Malijanov, Nicholas Isabel, Olaf Mueller Michaels, GM Pascal Charbonneau, Passy Passanen, Paul Bain, Paul Clarkson, Paul Sweeney, Paulo Santana, Peter Lux, Queenside Management Limited in Switzerland, Randy Temple, Ricky Grahava, Richard Hallenbach, Richard Tucker, Robert Callahan, Robert Titi, Robert Turner, Rory Coleman, Rory Yearwood, Ryan Berg, the Say Chess YouTube channel, Scott McKinnon, Scott Shepard, Sean Kraus, Sebastian Finsterwater, Walter, Sergey Magacon, Seth Ruzicka, Shane Unger, Silver Knights in Richmond, Stefan Roller, WGM Tatia Abrahamian, Tim Brennan of TacticsTime.com, Tim Seymour, Timothy Ha, FM Timothy Wall, Tom Edsel, Tomas Komanich, Tony Rattel, Tyron Price, Vishnu Srikumar, William Brock, William Peterson, FM Zhao Chang of Chess1000.com, and last but never least, Zhivko Stoyanov. Thanks for listening, everyone, and we will catch you all next week. Music.